All right, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for joining me this afternoon. Uh, we should definitely have time at the end for questions. So if you if things come up along the way, feel free to type them into the chat uh, and we can look at, look at them at the end um, or to chat in real time at the end. All right, uh, so my only disclosure is that as you likely know, this uh, was facilitated by Medila, although I won't be discussing their products and I have no other disclosures. So my objectives, which presumably you uh, have received uh, in your email, uh, we're going to review the processes of lactation um, from pregnancy and on. Uh, and at least uh, I definitely didn't learn any of this in medical school and uh, very little in my pediatric residency or my uh, neonatal perinatal fellowship. Uh, we're gonna discuss uh, common risk factors that can impact lactation, impact lactation um, and then finally share the evidence for a really proactive approach to lactation. My goal today really is to uh, share really simple interventions that can help better support our families, increase mother's own milk, and hopefully uh, improve outcomes. So we're gonna start with a case. Um, it's uh, purposely uh, a little bit uh, absurd uh, or uh, has lots of risk factors, but hopefully it'll be a good stepping off point for us. So Shayna is a prima. Uh, she has obesity and gestational diabetes. And unfortunately she develops preeclampsia. And because this is worsening and the baby's developing some growth restriction, um, she's induced at 32 weeks. She hasn't decided how she's going to feed her baby yet, but thinks she'll probably breastfeed. Unfortunately, the induction fails due to fetal D cells and she's taken to section. The baby does pretty well and is taken to the NICU on CPAP. So after arriving on the postpartum ward, the mom's told to hand express for her baby. She does it a couple times, but she doesn't really get anything. So that seems pretty pointless. So she stops because it's clearly not doing anything. But the next day, the nurse asked if there's any milk for the baby. So then they bring in a pump. It's a double electric pump, um, but mom uses it as a single so she can text while she's pumping. Uh, she finds it quite uncomfortable and she reports that most of her nipples being pulled into the flange. And because of this, and she's tired, um, she pumps a couple days and then sleeps through the night. A couple times a day and sleeps through the night. However, she brings the couple MLs that the baby needs. So she's happy and the NICU's happy. She goes home the next day, doesn't have a pump. So she hand expresses that home that night. And then the next day goes out to look for a pump. She figures her baby probably won't be in the NICU for very long, so she gets a single pump because they're a lot cheaper and she figures she won't need it. And then she finds if she pumps only three times a day, she gets, she gets more milk and that makes her happy, so she goes down to pumping three times a day. Now, a couple days later, the nurse checks in again because they're running out of milk for the baby. And they find that mom's making about 90 mLs a day. So they call a lactation consultant, who arranges a double electric pump rental and really talks to mom about how frequently she should be pumping, um, talks about pumping during the night, and then talks about power pumping to try to get her milk volumes up. Now with all of these interventions, she's able to increase her milk supply to about 250 mLs a day. And the baby goes home a few weeks later on partial breastfeeds. So definitely the baby got some good dose of mother's own milk. Um, but clearly there are opportunities for improvement. Um, so we'll use this uh, to discuss some of, our, uh, some of our interventions that could have potentially helped Sheena earlier. So I'm assuming I don't have to tell anyone who's listening uh, that mother's own milk is the gold standard. Uh, it's a cost-effective intervention, especially in sick or preterm babies to reduce costly morbidities. And this includes things like necrotizing enterocolitis and sepsis, which can be fatal as well as bronchopulmonary dysplasia and retinopathy of prematurity. But even in our healthy babies, we know it improves long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. And it's a dose response effect. So the more milk you get, the higher your IQ is on average. It reduces important morbidities in the community like asthma and allergy and obesity. And it even reduces your risk of childhood leukemia, which I think is super cool. And it reduces the risk of female cancers as well as type 2 diabetes in mom. 
And it's important to point out, especially to our families, that donor milk really is not at all the same thing because it's pooled and it's pasteurized. So not only is it nutritionally inferior, but it actually doesn't have all of the other benefits that I mentioned here with the exception of a reduction in neck in preterm babies. So since we know all this, um, despite this, a lot of babies don't receive their mother's milk. We're pretty good at starting in Canada. So almost all moms initiate lactation. But even by the time we get to hospital discharge, so only a day or three later, only about 62% are exclusively breastfeeding their babies. We look six months down the road, over a little over half are breastfeeding at all, and about a third are exclusively breastfeeding. So we're clearly falling quite short of that target of six months of exclusive breastfeeding for all babies that's recommended by the WHO and other entities. And when you ask moms, it's not that they don't want to keep breastfeeding their babies, but the majority of them report either objectively or subjectively that they just don't have enough milk or they have difficulty otherwise with breastfeeding. So why is this? Because clearly for a millennia, a majority of mothers haven't had a poor milk supply, or I wouldn't probably be sitting here talking to you today because we wouldn't have humans. So how can we support our modern moms and why are they having lactation problems? So I'll first focus on preterm delivery. So we know that moms that deliver early, they're very different than other moms. Typically, preterm delivery is the result of this complex interplay of social challenges, demographic factors, and mother or baby health factors. And these can affect maternal behaviors. So whether mom has to pump versus the baby directly breastfeeding, which can really affect that supply and demand. So it's mother-led or baby-led. It affects maternal infant dynamics because usually the baby and mom are separated if baby goes to NICU. And these can affect the timing of lactogenesis because of these risk factors, because of inadequate breast stimulation. So either by a baby who is not latching well or a pump as well as incomplete breast development because these moms are delivering uh, earlier in pregnancy. So we know of a lot of sociodemographic risk factors that puts mom at risk for either low initiation and or low continuation of lactation. So most of these are, um, are kind of all interrelated. Um, so low socioeconomic status and low educational attainments, the mom being young or unmarried or otherwise having poor social supports. Um, clearly a lack of intention to breastfeed is a risk factor, um, as well as Aboriginal or racialized populations. We also know of quite a few physiologic risk factors, and these are really common. Things like obesity affect almost half of the population. And we can't really unfortunately do anything about this, at least in real time. But as healthcare providers, what we can affect is the timing of milk expression and the frequency of milk expression. There's also infant risk factors for lactation. We talked about the baby being in the NICU or being early, a baby who's not latching well, whether it's just because they're preterm or they have a cleft palate or something. And again, can't really do a lot about these at the moment. But what we can modify is unnecessary or early formula supplementation as a risk factor for lactation. And this is part of a screensaver that we're currently using at sick kids in our NICU to kind of remind us of the normal physiology of lactation. Uh, so this uh, oral syringe in the middle here is showing a couple MLs. So this is a reminder to us that when a healthy term baby goes to the breast in the first day or two of life, if they're lucky, they may be getting a teaspoon of colostrum, but often less. So mother nature, again, in a healthy term baby, has kind of built in enough backup resources that this is enough for the baby. But when we're supplementing, again, for non-medically indicated supplementation, we're giving the baby this, what looks like a gigantic bottle compared to this oral syringe, usually 60 mLs. And if you think about it, if the baby takes this, they're quite satiated. And then we're really messing with the supply and demand of those first couple of days when the baby is going to be really frequently going to breast, which then helps stimulate the mom's milk supply. 
So to kind of put the recommendations in context, I'm going to briefly review lactation physiology. And we're not going to go into massive detail. Hopefully it won't put you to sleep. But I think it's really important to understand this. And it's important to find a way to share this with our families um, to really help them understand why it's so important in these first couple of days uh, to really focus on getting a milk supply. So during pregnancy, obviously the breast goes through a lot of changes. So you go from this quiescent state that's occurring after puberty and the cells start to get ready to make milk. So secretary differentiation or lactogenesis one is when those cells differentiate to be able to make milk. It's under hormonal control, especially prolactin. And you actually start to make colostrum in small amounts starting at 16 weeks, so pretty early on. But as you can see in this picture up in the right-hand corner, the junctions between cells are leaky. So even if you build up some milk, it all kind of leaks out through those, uh, through those junctions and goes back into the maternal serum and is actually excreted. So you can find lactose, for example, in the urine of pregnant women. However, right after delivery, this whole series of hormonal changes occurs, which is pretty incredible. This starts lactogenesis two or secretory activation, which usually occurs within three days of a term delivery. So although there are lots of different hormonal changes, what really triggers it is this plummet in uh, progesterone once the placenta is delivered, which is why if you have retained placenta, um, moms can have lactation difficulties. Importantly, lact lactogenesis two isn't necessarily reliant on breast stimulation, but it can be influenced. So again, even if moms don't intend to breastfeed, their milk can come in. But conversely, moms who do intend to can make their milk come in faster uh, if they undergo more breast stimulation in these first few days. And I reported that in a preterm population, I'm from a Chicago cohort, that in these pump dependent mothers, the more they pumped in the first few days, the more likely they were for their milk to come in and for it to come in faster. So once the placenta is delivered and that progesterone plummets, progesterone has been inhibiting prolactin during pregnancy. So now prolactin is free to do its thing. So prolactin then catalyzes the closure of those junctions. So remember we talked about those cells are leaky. So prolactin makes them squeak together and makes those junctions tight, which basically traps lactose in the gland. Now with osmosis, lactose draws water in and voila, you basically make milk. That's how the mom starts feeling her milk come in where the breasts get warm or lumpy and all of a sudden she has milk. So once your milk comes in though, a totally different process takes over and you go from just hormonal control to autocrine control where you need breast stimulation, but you also need to take that milk out in order for the next steps, which are coming to volume, which I'll talk about, as well as copious milk production. Each breast is locally controlled. So if you only pump or feed on one side, that's the only side that's gonna make milk. And what I really wanna emphasize, and I'll come back to this concept over and over, is that these first couple of days and weeks are really critical for breast programming. And what I mean by that is getting the breast ready to make milk, not for that day, but for weeks and months and maybe even years. And these first few days really determine that ability. So prolactin is incredibly important in this process. So we already talked about it closes those tight junctions, but it also upregulates genes that make more lactosate. Uh, and this is really important if you deliver early because you didn't have enough time to, for your breast to fully develop. So you get more lactosates and it also prevents apoptosis of lactosates. So overall you get more in general because you make more and you lose less. And although it's not as important later, high concentrations of prolactin are really vital in these first couple of weeks. And low levels can jeopardize milk production basically forever. So how do we get prolactin if it's such a good thing? So these are old studies, but physiology doesn't really change. So in both studies, they're looking at prolactin levels in the first couple of days of life. And the bar on the left is before suckling, and the bar on the right is after. So you can see you get this really big jump in prolactin. So you get this prolactin surge 
and early, effective, and frequent breast stimulation are really critical to get that surge, which then causes that feedback loop for optimal breast programming. Now, importantly, just because you close those tight junctions, that doesn't mean you're kind of set and done. Uh, I reported for the first time in a preterm population that those tight junctions, unfortunately, can open back up if moms aren't pumping as frequently. So I'm not gonna go into tons of detail about this study, but it's basically looking at components in milk, such as sodium, that indirectly tell me what's happening in the breast and they're telling me when the junctions are closing. This is a mom on the left who pumped quite well, pumping between usually eight and 12 times a day. So excellent pumping behaviors. And this red line here is sodium. Sodium really drops and that's a signal that those tight junctions have squeaked closed. At the same time, this yellow bar, which is her milk volume, is really going up. And you can see she's already making 500 ml a day by day five, and it just keeps going. Now this mom isn't pumping as frequently. You can see that her this red bar, sodium, it drops a bit, but not as much. And her the yellow bar, this volume, goes up, but again, not as much because the scale is different. But what I really wanna point out is here, you can see that around day 12 or so, she pumped only twice in one day for whatever reason. You can see that nearly immediately, the red bar, the sodium increases and increases really back up to where it was at the very beginning when she was making colostrum. And at the same time, uh, the volume goes down. And so this really shows us again um, that these, these junctions uh, can become leaky again. So it's really important for continued intense lactation support in these first couple of weeks of life. In these first couple of weeks, this is just a visual showing that you want to get more prolactin to make more lactosates. But if you don't use those lactosates, you basically lose them. They undergo apoptosis and the body starts to prune them. Now that might be okay initially when your baby's not eating very much. But then when you do need more milk uh, a week or two down the road or a month down the road, those lactocytes are gone and you really can't easily get them back, resulting in a low milk supply. And then moms who aren't able to necessarily exclusively breastfeed. So all this is important again with breast programming to talk to parents that when they have a preterm baby, we really have to kind of trick the breast into thinking that they have a term baby. So why is that? So this is just milk supply. So you can see these first couple of days, a term baby doesn't eat very much because there's not much milk. And then you have this nice kind of slow increase in milk supply over weeks to months. Now a preterm baby doesn't need to eat very much. So their requirements are a lot lower. But someday, weeks or months down the road, that prime is going to correct to a term baby with term baby needs. The problem though is if if we've only kind of programmed the breast to make enough milk to supply this preterm baby, we have a problem when they get to term. And the issue is that at that time, it's really hard to significantly increase your milk supply, making exclusive breastfeeding challenging. So we really need to, again, in these crucial first couple of days and week, weeks, really build that mom supply. And multiple studies, uh, including one of my own, have shown that making at least 500 ml a day in moms that deliver very preterm in the first 14 days, it's very strongly correlated to providing milk at NICU discharge and much more so than any sociodemographic or maternal risk factor. So we know this physiology, but what can we do about it now? How do we translate this into practice? So we really need to start as providers before all of this happens. So prenatally is ideal, even preconception is better if we have contact uh, with moms who are thinking of getting pregnant or even moms uh, of pregnancy age, because as we know, not all pregnancies are planned. We know that encouragement and support from healthcare providers really increases the intention to breastfeed. It increases intention, it increases initiation rates, and it increases duration of breastfeeding. And this doesn't have to be this long diatribe about lactation, um, really focusing on that babies who are breastfed are smarter, are healthier, 
moms are healthier. It's free, basically. Um, it's easy to get, uh, unlike, for instance, right now having to stand in line uh, to get formula uh, in COVID, times of COVID, and it's portable. We know that prenatal breastfeeding education classes in really any form are a very effective intervention that also in increase duration and exclusivity, as well as maternal confidence. And importantly, we want to normalize breastfeeding at every opportunity. So whether it's in your office, having a sign saying that breastfeeding is welcome here, uh, or having pictures of moms breastfeeding uh, in your NICU or, or in, your, in your practice is important. We want to involve the partner or, or the family, depending on the cultural context. It might be that the mother-in-law is kind of the way in. And there's a lot of great resources online, again, even during times of COVID. Um, to help both providers and families. So that's prenatally, but then now the baby is here. So what do we do postnatally? So in those critical early periods, we need to initiate milk expression, whether it's breastfeeding or with a pump, early, often, and effectively. So what does this mean? So in a healthy term baby, this means using baby friendly or similar policies. So breastfeeding basically immediately after birth, even after a C-section. No, form no formula supplementation in hospital unless it's truly medically indicated. And then rooming in with on-demand breastfeeding. And we know that hospitals who do this are much more likely to have high exclusive breastfeeding rates at discharge. Now breastfeeding can be challenging after C-section. Um, but they're with, uh, with the, the proper uh, interventions, it can definitely happen. So this is uh, actually an article from a developing setting. This is from India, I believe. Uh, and in this, uh, in this project, which there have been many similar projects elsewhere, um, they really wanted to show that they could get moms breastfeeding within an hour of C-section. So they designated a person to ensure the baby goes to the breast. That was their job, so they could focus on that. There was a medical order in the chart. So just like giving a medication, there was an order that had to be checked off, a physician order. And they realized they had to facilitate breastfeeding in the OR or in the PACU, because if they waited to get to the postpartum ward, that hour or two was just gone. And similar projects have been done with pumping uh, for a, a very low birth weight infant as well. So pumping within an hour of section or pumping in the operating room. In this particular study, moms who breastfed soon after C-section went from basically no one to almost everyone. So if there is a will, if there's buy-in, this is definitely possible. So how about your late preterm or your near-term babies? So these babies are really tough. They're tricky. They're disguised as term babies. They look like they should do more than they do. However, they rapidly fatigue with breastfeeding they slip off the nipple. They look like they're feeding, but they're really not. They're immature, so they don't necessarily wake to demand feed. And this combination results in inadequate stimulation and emptying of the breast. And again, it can be challenging because they might've been at the breast for 20 minutes, but if you're not really doing anything or stimulating the breast, you're just kind of sleeping, it doesn't really count. So these moms are at high risk for decreased milk supply if they're not pumping afterwards. They're not programming the breast optimally. So they really need proactive lactation and nursing support. These are the moms that fall through the cracks because their babies go home and they go home very quickly. And again, people treat them like their term, but they're really not. There's really not, there's some evidence for cup versus bottle or nipple shields, but really I think the most important thing is making sure that moms pump afterwards if the baby isn't adequately stimulating the breast. As with all babies, skin to skin and rooming in is always good. So how about our NICU babies? So that's my specialty, so I'll spend a, a little bit of time on that. But we know that providing mother's milk for longer and at higher amounts is related to starting to double electric pump early on, to pump frequently, at least five times, but uh, ideally at least eight times a day, in kangaroo care. And I'll go into a bit more detail about why these are. So Leslie Parker has done quite a few studies looking at timing of uh, pumping in very low birth weight infant mothers. 
This trial on the left uh, is a study of these moms who were randomized to either pump within six hours or after six hours. Moms who pumped within the first six hours made twice as much milk in the first week, but importantly, they also made more milk at six weeks. And they were twice as likely to still be lactating at six weeks. In this study, the results were driven by moms who initiated pumping within one hour, which can be challenging. So she actually published another study this year in which she tries to try to tease that out some more. And actually, she didn't find the same thing about, about um, initiating within an hour. Um, so that's good in a way because it gives us a bit more time. Um, but it does seem that pumping within those first six hours is really important. So similar to results she found in an earlier study in which moms who pumped earlier, their milk came in earlier and their milk volumes were higher all along. So here you can see from the very beginning, moms that pumped within six hours made more milk the first day, second day, and they just kept going. And even by week six, they were making a lot more milk just from programming the breast a few hours earlier. So the importance of initiating expression early is also that we know that low volumes correlate with lactation challenges. So moms that aren't making very much milk by day four have a much higher risk of formula feeding at NICU discharge. Uh, and so clearly the earlier you start pumping, the more like you are, likely you are to have higher volumes. And as I alluded to before, those first two weeks really seem quite critical in determining future lactation ability. So multiple studies, including my own, have shown that meeting that 500 ml a day threshold is really important um, for being able, being able to prognosticate who's still lactating at NICU discharge. So we talked about initiating early. We also have to initiate often. So for healthy term and many late preterm babies, breastfeeding on demand. For moms whose babies can't demand breastfeed, pumping for 15 to 20 minutes every few hours, ideally at least eight times a day, and waking at least once during the night to pump. So I recommend not going longer than five hours, um, because if you go longer than five hours, um, the, the physiology of the breast can change. And you have to think about the fact that if you had a healthy term baby at home, there's no way they would be sleeping five hours during the night in those first couple of days to weeks. So again, you really have to um, kind of trick the breast into thinking that you have a healthy term baby who would be feeding every few hours, even during the night. So early, often, and effectively. So in moms that are pump dependent for lactation initiation, although there's a whole bunch of different types of pumps on the market, there's really only one kind of pump that you should be using in that particular situation. Uh, this is a review paper um, whose first author is one of my mentors in Chicago. It's a really nice review of which pump is appropriate for which mother or which situation. But in this case, for a pump dependent mom for initiation, you really need a double electric pump, um, ideally hospital grade. This is really the standard of care for moms whose babies can't feed at all at breast, and it programs the best, the breast best. The doubledness is important as well, because not only is it faster, um, which is a good selling point for moms, um, but studies have shown that moms get more milk early as well as for weeks afterwards if they double versus single electro pump in the first 10 days of life. So again, speaking to that breast programming. I always encourage moms here to have a hands-free pumping bra, um, whether they buy it or whether they make it themselves um, from a sports bra, this is a lifesaver to be able to double electric pump. And importantly, hand expression alone, in my opinion, is really not adequate to establish a milk supply. And it really shouldn't be used alone in at-risk pump-dependent mothers. And I'll explain why. So these are, again, old studies. Again, the CLG doesn't really change. And this is showing us prolactin levels that you get either from a baby here on the left or with hand expression. So you get a much lower increase in prolactin levels with hand expression there, as well as with milk volumes. So lowest, uh, lowest uh, volumes compared to any kind of pump, whether it's manual or electric compared to hand expression. This is another study showing the increase in prolactin with suckling or uh, going to breast 
as well as the increase or lack thereof prolactin um, with just hand expression. So when you're when the baby is suckling or baby going to the is going to breast, you increase your prolactin, which increases your milk production, and then you also obviously express the milk. When you're doing hand expression, you're really only expressing the milk, but you're not causing that prolactin surge. So we have to remember that the baby is the gold standard. So when they breastfeed, they, there's suction and compression, which releases prolactin and oxytocin. An electric pump does the suction, but not compression, and the hand expression is the opposite. But you really need suction for prolactin release. And so that's why the electric pump is so superior for hand expression, especially for those moms who are initiating lactation. This has been shown in a couple studies. Uh, so this was a study looking at hand expression versus a couple types of electric pump. So you can see from the beginning, moms that use a double electric pump made quite a bit more milk initially from, than hand expression. And then by the end of the study on day 10, uh, they were making 250 mLs a day more milk. Uh, so in a very preterm baby, that's a huge difference. I really like this study though um, by Lucier uh, from a couple of years ago. And this was a randomized controlled trial that randomized moms to hand expression versus double electric pumping in the first uh, week of life. So you can see that with an electric pump, which is the white bar, moms from the very beginning made a lot more milk. And actually in the first seven days, they made three, they made so much more milk, almost a liter more milk, um, which again, for a very low birth weight infant, is a huge, huge number. So that's impressive, but what's even more interesting and what's more critical, I think, is that moms that have randomized to hand expression were then switched over and they started double electric pumping at that point. They never caught up to the moms who started double electric pumping from the beginning. Again, suggesting that this early window for breast, breast programming is really important. So how do we put all this together? So to support exclusive breastfeeding in your healthy baby, you want to uh, breastfeed early, so in that golden hour, which has helped with skin to skin and rooming in. You want to breastfeed often and effectively. So having a baby rooming in and skin to skin really encourages that really, really frequent breastfeeding that you see in the first couple of days, um, feeding even every hour if that's what the baby wants. And those moms that are at risk, again, skin to skin is always good but you want to express early in that first hour, even if the mom had a C-section. You, know, you wouldn't be waiting to feed a baby under normal circumstances, so we shouldn't wait uh, to pump. Express often. So if the baby is trying to breastfeed but isn't latching well, pumping after every session of breastfeeding or at least every, every two to three hours. And then expressing effectively. So again, if the baby isn't feeding well, using an appropriate pump, so not just hand expression. So a double electric, ideally hospital grade pump if moms are pump dependent for lactation initiation. And what I think is really important, uh, and we talked to our nursing staff about this, is reassurance to the pumping mom. So the challenge with the pump is that you can, you can see it. You can see how much milk or how little milk you're making. Whereas you really can't have it, you don't have that same visual when baby's going to the breast at first. And moms get really frustrated when they pump for 20 minutes and they get like literally nothing or they get a drop. And it seems like it's so pointless and they're doing something wrong or they're failing. We have to reassure them that this is normal. It's completely normal to get nothing when you first pump. And that I really don't care how much they make at that time because the purpose of pumping in the first day or two is not to make milk at that time. The purpose of the pump in the first day or two is to program the breast so then you have milk in a week and in a month and in a year. So those early volumes aren't important, but the early breast stimulation is. So once, we, once our milk has come in and once we've hopefully established our supply, how do we maintain that? Because we've seen that challenge with numbers in Canada. So these are a couple studies showing what we can do, particularly for the preterm infants, uh, to prolong lactation. So this was an Israeli study, and they looked at which moms were able to breastfeed for at least six months. They found that direct breastfeeding in the NICU 
was the by far the strongest risk, risk factor for prolonged lactation. So if babies are breastfed in the NICU, moms were much more likely to breastfeed for at least six months. And all of the other factors kind of washed out. Importantly, moms that exclusively pumped, their mother's milk duration and, an exclus and exclusivity were halved. So months and months fewer, less of breast milk. So their breastfeeding dose, their lifelong breastfeeding dose was significantly reduced if they exclusively pumped which granted sometimes is necessary, but sometimes it's just because we didn't give moms enough opportunity to feel comfortable in the NICU. This has been shown in many other studies. So in this uh, 2011 study, whether the infant was ever put to breast, ever, and the number of times they were put to breast in the NICU predicted mother's milk at discharge. One direct breastfeeding a day in the NICU meant they were more likely to be breastfeeding four months later. And in this pretty large study of American mothers, they found similar to the previous study that in exclusive pumpers, they had a much shorter lactation duration after they controlled for all the other risk factors. So it's really important uh, to, if moms, if that's part of their breastfeeding journey and part of their goal to try to get babies to breast while they're in hospital. If we need to objectively measure intake, uh, baby or waist scales can be really important. Um, in addition, obviously things like uh, watching the baby swallow and watching weight gain, uh, but waist scales can give us objective data as healthcare providers and can also um, kind of help guide families. We know these scales are accurate to two mLs and there's been many, many studies showing that they're accurate. Uh, as well as a study showing that when uh, babies were uh, weighed on scales, uh, they actually achieved full breastfeeding at a younger corrected gestational age and were discharged earlier. So let's go back to our case. Um, so as a reminder, again, we have our primate mom with preeclampsia, wasn't sure if she's going to breastfeed, has a section and the baby's taken to NICU. So clearly, Shana has a ton of challenges uh, for lactation, a lot of risk factors. She's a first time mom, she's diabetic, she's obese, has preeclampsia, the baby was born early, she had a section, she's not really sure if she's gonna breastfeed prenatally, and baby and mom are separated, and mom is pump dependent for lactation initiation. So clearly she has a lot going on. But many moms do have a lot of these risk factors. So how do we support Shayna? What should we have done um, to make her more successful? So early, if possible, prenatal counseling on the importance of mother's own milk, really reiterating that it's like a medicine for our preterm babies. And talking to mom about the importance of pumping very early, often and effectively to help program the breast to make sure that she's able to breastfeed if that's what she wants months later. Again, early frequent effective expression with a double electric pump. We shouldn't be recommending hand expression alone in cases like this where mom is pump dependent. And early frequent and proactive lactation support. When moms have this many risk factors, in my opinion, we shouldn't wait until they have complications because they probably are going to. We should just assume that they're going to have challenges and see how we can best support them. So close monitoring of daily volumes in those first two weeks. So in those first couple of days, we might, we might have noticed that Shayna was uh, would not have been very much milk output. And then we could have seen how much how often she was actually pumping. Again, our goal is to have a supply pretty similar to a term mom. Early skin to skin is always helpful. And then when the baby and mom are ready, early attempts at breastfeeding, remembering to pump afterwards to program the breast until breastfeeding is effective. For additional resources on this, um, so I've put all of these concepts together into a manuscript that'll be coming out uh, in the coming months. It's in a special human milk issue of seminars in perinatology. And I also wanted to uh, draw your attention to this UNICEF WHO document. It's this really lovely um, baby-friendly document, but specific for hospitalized babies. So small, sick, or preterm newborns. And it's just an incredible resource. Um, even just the reference section is really helpful, but um, it kind of goes through all of the all of the evidence for this population. 
and has helpful charts like this, for example, is the average amount of uh, breast milk moms make when they're pumping each day uh, in the first week to help moms kind of compare it to, to normal. We've kind of put these together into best practices, both for the NICU and non-NICU. Um, if anyone's interested in these, uh, in these evidence-based documents, just uh, reach out um, and uh, we can send those to you. And a really nice uh, QI resource, um, Medela's educational website is lovely. Again, I'm not promoting Medela, but the educational website is great. Um, this uh, improving the use of human milk in the NICU follows that document that I talked about, that WHO UNICEF document. And it's a really nice way to see kind of what your hospital can work on. Um, so there's a mother scorecard, so talking about um, maternal education and frequency of expression. And again, all of these scorecards are kind of taken directly from uh, evidence in that document, as well as a BB scorecard. So skin to skin, dose of mother's own milk, transitioning to direct feeding at breast. Um, again, all, uh, all very evidence-based. So in conclusion, uh, establishing an adequate milk volume is I think the most important lactation related responsibility for us as maternity and neonatal healthcare providers. We really have to have this sense of urgency. We need to educate frontline providers. So in addition to fellow physicians, educating our nurses and our NICU staff uh, so they understand the importance of talking to moms early on. And then education of families, not to put pressure on them, but to provide them with education so then they can make their own informed decision and help them understand uh, why these first few days are so important to then help them meet their lactation goals. Because um, we really want it to be their choice as far as how long they're able to breastfeed for, um, not something they have to do because of the poor supply. Again, proactive lactation support is ideal when there's multiple risk factors involved. So trying to uh, address those issues before they come up. And importantly, lactation initiation is a one-time event. It's this time-limited event um, that we can help modify. Success is full secretory activation, so the closure of those tight junctions, which means more milk, and adequate breast programming, which makes everyone happy. But if we're not able to, to program the breast effectively, we can have partial secretory activation, so partial closure of those junctions, and a lower milk supply. So again, we want to be able to support our families to provide them with education and provide them with resources to help them meet their breastfeeding goals, whatever they are. So I want to say thank you and I'm very happy to take any questions. And I think this webinar should be posted. So there's tons of references uh, if you're interested while you're, uh, while you're hanging out this COVID winter. Thanks. I'm going to stop sharing so I can try to see I don't know if there's any chat at all.